I've never been one to be creeped out by paranormal occurrences. I think I've more of a share of them than most people, and I guess I somehow just got used to them. When I was a child, afraid of ghosts hiding in my closet, my father comforted me by saying, Look, son, if ghosts exist, then they are just people, just like you and me. Not every person you meet is bad, right? I nodded weakly, the covers pulled up to my nose. Then why would every ghost be bad? My seven-year-old mind couldn't come up with the flaw in his logic, and it seemed to do the trick. I was no longer afraid of the dark or what might be in it. I later suspected, but never got the chance to ask, that my father may have had his own experiences with things lesser known. It wasn't until I was an adult, years after my father passed away, that I realized how odd it was that he didn't try to tell me that ghosts didn't exist at all. Either way, I was for the most part thankful for that. It may have been my lack of fear for the unknown that caused me to see things more often than most. I didn't go about my daily life seeing dead people walking the streets. Or if I did, I never noticed. But it seemed my experiences were more numerous than most. A lot of people would go their entire lives without anything strange. Some will have one or two experiences that stick with them forever while others seemed to attract them like magnets. Most of the things I saw fell in two categories. The typical white mesh shape of a person that I assumed are ghosts, and the infamous shadow people. I'm not exactly sure what the latter are. Maybe just another kind of ghost. I won't claim to know, or that I'm any sort of expert. When I see either one, I don't give it much notice or alarm and will act like it's just another person going about their business. Nothing I'd seen had done much to interact with me in turn, much less try to cause harm. They never even so much as talked to me, with just a handful of exceptions. Until several months ago, when one shadow person in particular started appearing frequently. Now, for the most part, I think shadow people get a bad rep. I know there's been a few that have messed with people in very extreme ways, but these honestly seem more like the outliers. I had seen plenty before, and they never seemed to do much more than any other spook. Of course, like people, there are the occasional bad apples. Now this one I started seeing on the regular was small. The size and shape similar to a child wearing a sheet, except being completely devoid of light. I won't try to get into some flowery description of the kind of darkness these shadows are. If you've seen them, you know. And if you've read about them, you're aware of the common description of them being less of a shadow and more devoid of light. This one in particular first appeared in my driveway. I had just kissed my wife goodbye and was heading to work for the day. There it was, standing in front of my car. It seemed to be hunched over the recently waxed hood, as if trying to see its reflection. I walked up beside it and peered down as well, seeing that it did indeed have a presence in the mirrored surface. Some do, and some don't though I've never figured out the whys or the hows of it. I just gave a curious, huh, and then got in my car. As I put it in reverse and was about to back out of the driveway, it was still standing in front, now fully upright. I assumed it was looking at me and just gave a wave before heading off. No need to be rude, right? For several weeks after that, I'd see it in various places, never doing much but loitering around, staring at something or another and what seemed to be curiosity. One morning when leaving for work, it was standing under the tree in my yard, slightly bent so it was hard to tell if it was looking up at the bird nest above it, 
or something else on the ground below it. It seemed to notice me and straighten up, and I'd give a friendly wave and good morning. I would see it occasionally gliding silently across my office, stopping near co-workers and just observing. I'd see it in the hallway, staring at the pictures on my wall. My wife, Lucy, who I'd been married to for just a little over a year at this point, never seemed to notice it, even when it would slide right up to her, and for a lack of a better word, stare for several seconds before heading off to whatever else it found interesting. It almost gave me a start one afternoon when I was leaving for work. I got in my car and jumped a bit from the movement in my rearview mirror. At first I had thought it was a mugger or a carjacker, which is what put me on edge, but I breathed a sigh of relief in seeing what it was. Ghosts and shadows haven't hurt me in my entire 28 years on this earth, but the living hurt each other all too often. Sorry, you surprised me, <laughs> I said. Like always, I received no response. Most people would find this creepy and stalkerish, but it felt more like a quiet friend hanging around out of boredom. One night, after a couple of months of being followed around, I woke up suddenly in the night. I jolted awake from a nightmare. Not any sort of hellish, Lovecraftian nightmare or any kind of premonition. It was bees. A lot of bees violently buzzing around me, and when one finally landed and stung me on my arm, I awoke with a start. The stinging sensation on my forearm still felt fresh and real, and I wondered for a moment if an actual insect had found its way into our bed. I turned on the light, pulling up the covers, looking around. This of course woke Lucy up, who told me to cut it out. I relaxed a bit, though my arm still felt like it had been stung, but there was no swelling or anything, so I let it go. As I was turning off the light, I had noticed just then that the shadow was at the foot of my bed, watching the entire thing. A tiny prickling of suspicion popped up in the back of my head, but shrugged it off and went back to sleep. It wasn't the first time I'd found something staring at me in my room. The next morning I woke up with the beginnings of a headache. Lucy, ever perceptive, asked me at breakfast, how are you feeling? Just a bit of a headache is all. I'll be fine, I said over my coffee. The little shadow stood in the corner of the kitchen. It was still there when I woke up and followed me there. It followed me still when I left for work. It hovered over me the entire day and followed me again as I left to go home. The entire day, my headache slowly grew more painful in the back of my head. On the drive back, I tried talking to it again. You're sticking pretty close today. Are you trying to tell me something? I asked. No response, other than some kind of shifting in its form. Typical. I got home and took some aspirin, hoping it would ease the throbbing in my skull. I had dinner, watched some TV, then decided to go to bed early. The entire time shadowed by the shadow. Something was starting to feel off. It was soon confirmed when I was lying in bed, my stalker hovering just beside me. As I was just about to doze off, I heard it speak for the first time. It was a soft, hushed whisper, a voice so light it could be carried away by a mere breath like a little girl afraid of being heard. Don't sleep. The quietness of its voice didn't diminish the effect of jerking back to full alertness. I turned to give it a long, hard stare before closing my eyes again, just as I was thinking I imagined it, and began to drift off to Dreamville. It pulled me right back again. Don't sleep. Lucy had yet to come to bed, so I turned over and faced it. What do you want? 
I asked, getting annoyed. No answer came. Well? I asked again, to the same result. I rolled over, facing away from it, and tried again. Like before, I got just to the edge of consciousness when I heard it for the third time. Don't sleep. Why? I asked, now losing my patience. My head's killing me. I just want to sleep it off. As expected, no answer. Not until I tried again to rest. Don't sleep. Son of a bitch! I all but yelled. Lucy walked in at that point. Seemingly ready for bed herself now. What's wrong, honey? She asked in a concerned tone. She walked over to her side of the bed and got under the covers. Uh, nothing. Just trouble sleeping, I replied. I'd never told her about the things I see, and wasn't about to now. She'd regret marrying a lunatic. Oh, well, keep trying, sweetie. I'm sure sleep will come. She snuggled up next to me and got comfortable, and soon drifted off herself. I wasn't so lucky. I didn't get a single wink that night, and my headache only grew slowly more intense. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. I lost count of how many times I'd heard those two words that night. The following morning found me to be an irritable zombie. Lucy seemed concerned, wringing her hands in worry like some old lady. You don't look good, dear. Maybe you should call in sick, she suggested. I wouldn't have it, though. I figured if I could mentally exhaust myself enough today, then tonight I'd be able to fall asleep regardless of anyone or anything's interference. My tormentor continued following me that day as well. I was so tired I could barely function, but managed to do my work anyway. At one point, I began to nod off at my desk. Don't sleep. Damn it. Later that afternoon, I got in my car to go home. I put the keys in the ignition, but didn't start it yet. I took a moment to rub my eyes, trying to gather myself before driving. I took a few moments too long and almost fell asleep right there. Don't sleep. This is getting very old, very fast. I started the car and headed home. I ate my dinner in a complete daze, almost planting my face into my meal. Don't sleep. Almost. I went to watch TV and put it on the most boring thing I could. It didn't take but a few minutes for the idiot tube to start working its magic, and right as my head started to fall to the side. Don't sleep. You guessed it. It came time for bed, for all the good it would do me. I lay there, eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. The second I closed them, it would say it again, somehow jerking me wide awake. I was exhausted. At about 3 a.m., my wife was enviously snoozing beside me. My sadistic former friend still stood on my opposite side. It had gotten to leaning in close to my face slowly over the past few hours. I'd blink. Don't sleep. Blink again. Don't sleep. The damn thing wouldn't even let me close my eyes. I got up to get a glass of water. I don't know why. It just seemed better than laying there, listening to a broken record. My headache had reached new levels of pain I'd never known before. I almost fell asleep standing there up in front of the sink, glass in hand. Don't sleep. Damn it! For Christ's sake, why are you doing this? I turned on the small frame fully, my sanity about to crack. I thought I was going to get the same silent treatment as before, but after a long several moments, it finally said something different. Nice. 
It set me off. Nice? What the hell is that supposed to mean? I'm going crazy because you won't let me sleep, and that's all you have to say? I was full-blown yelling now. My wife rushed in at that point, being woken up by my commotion. Honey, what is wrong with you? She had a scared look in her eyes. It seemed she was going to think me crazy regardless now, standing in the kitchen yelling at nothing in the middle of the night. I just can't sleep. I answered tiredly, sliding myself into a chair at the kitchen table. I put my head in my hands, and as much as my body wanted to, still couldn't give out and rest. Don't sleep. I hadn't even noticed my wife leaving the room, but she soon returned, holding her hand out to me. Here, take these. They should knock you right out. It isn't good to go without sleep, she said offering me a couple of pills. I felt stupid for not thinking of it before. Surely a little chemical assistance should do the trick, right? As I reached out to take them from Lucy, the thing suddenly grew more insistent. Desperate, almost. Don't sleep. 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 It was unnerving now. But I wasn't going to let this thing kill me. People die if they don't get enough sleep. As my wife dropped the pills into my hand, the shadow reached out and grabbed my wrist. It didn't feel like something was physically there. It was like an intense, bassy vibration going through my wrist. I felt it all the way to my core. My hand was shaking. And as it built up momentum, suddenly put one final push at the peak of its frequency, flinging the pills out of my hand and skittering across the kitchen floor. Don't sleep nice. 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 Don't please. Please nice. Don't sleep. It was running it all together frantically, making it sound more like a noise than words now. I lost it then. I stood up suddenly, knocking my chair back and screamed. Poor Lucy backed away in shock. Sweetie? Sweetie? Please calm down. Please? It's okay. She tried to comfort me, but I was too far gone now. I bolted out the door barefoot and having no idea where I was going. I just wanted to get as far away from that thing as I could and get some rest. It stayed right on my heels, though, repeating itself like a mantra. My brain felt like it was trying to pound out the back of my skull, each step jogging a more piercing pain. My lungs ached from how fast I was sprinting. I got to a four-way stop, and the shadow had come up to my right. I instinctively turned left, trying to get as far away from it as I could. It stuck with me no matter how far or fast I ran though occasionally pulling up beside me again, causing me to turn away from it. I zigged and zagged through the streets for I don't know how many miles before my endurance began to give out. I collapsed to my knees on the sidewalk, the shadow hovering right over me still. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. Don't sleep. I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't know what else to do but cry. Hey man, you okay? Someone was asking me. A young man wearing scrubs was kneeling down next to me, worry on his face. What's wrong? Let me help you. I realized then I was in front of a hospital. One last hope. One last hope. I could barely choke out the words. My head can't sleep. Hurt. I was holding the back of my head, the pain beyond description now. The man yelled for someone and dragged me to my feet. Come on, let's get you inside to get you checked out. It'll be all right. I was quickly taken inside. Before too long, they were putting me into an MRI machine. The small shades stayed there. 
making sure I didn't so much as blink without its insistent reminder. Don't sleep. After a few moments in the machine, I was taken right back out. The doctor rushed to explain. We found a serious problem. We need to operate now. Do you understand? I could only nod my head in agreement. Anything to stop this nightmare. The shadow surely can't stop them from injecting me with something to make me sleep. My stomach did a somersault, thought of what I got. They placed me face down on a table, with a hole for my face to poke through. The shadow was hunched down in front of me, still on continuous repeat. I'm just going to give you a local anesthetic. I'm afraid we can't put you under for this procedure. We have to work fast. I promise to explain in more detail once you're out of the woods. Just try to relax, sir. And with that, I felt a familiar prick at the back of my neck. I lay there for what felt like an eternity. All at once, the pain in my head seemed to dissipate into nothing as the doctor worked whatever magic he had. Okay, get him into recovery for some rest, he said to one of the nurses. I soon found myself in a comfortable but unfamiliar bed, the shade still beside me, oddly silent now as the doctor spoke. You're past the worst of it now, but you still have some severe fatigue and exhaustion. Just rest easy here and get some sleep, okay? I nodded my response without a word. And as he left the room, turning the lights off behind him, I turned to face the now silent shadow. Sleep now. And I did. I woke feeling better than I had in a long time though the back of my neck was still a bit sore from where they cut me. My wife was beside my bed, holding my hand when I opened my eyes. The shadow was silent in the corner of the room. She called for the doctor as soon as I was awake, and he was there within minutes to explain the situation. It seemed I had a partial blood clot in a major vein in my neck. The spot it was in was tricky, at a point where it branches off. The only thing keeping it in place was my elevated blood pressure. If I had gone to sleep, my blood pressure would have dropped and it would have come loose and entered my brain, very likely killing me. I was floored by this. Nice. Because I was nice to it. A simple hello, good morning, a wave every now and then was all it took. I cried then. My wife and doctor, I'm sure, assumed it was from the relief, but it was from guilt and shame. They kept me for only a few more hours. The doctor took some blood for tests to find out what was the cause of the clot, as I was in otherwise good health. He released me that evening, saying that he would call the next morning. That night, as I was preparing for bed, Lucy was still in the shower. And I was alone in the bedroom. The shadow stood in the corner, I assume staring at me. I spoke low so my wife wouldn't hear. You saved me. Thank you. Really. And I'm sorry, I said. Its form seemed to shift as if in acknowledgement. It didn't say anything, though. I assumed it was difficult for them to talk to us, which would explain their relative silence. I guess this one must have put a lot of effort into keeping me awake. The next morning I sat down to breakfast, a simple egg and bacon sandwich on toast. Lucy had finished the dishes and headed into the other room to start the laundry, having already ate. She was always the early riser of us two. Before I could get the sandwich into my mouth, a hushed whisper found its way to my ears. Don't eat. I stopped cold, the sandwich just in front of my mouth. I looked over to see the shadow standing in front of the sink. Don't eat. It repeated itself. The phone rang then, so I set my meal on the plate and answered. 
it was the doctor calling back about my test results. We found signs in your blood that you may have somehow got a procoagulant into your system. This is a very serious matter. I'll need you to come in for another evaluation and to answer a few questions. Please bring your wife as well to get checked out, as it may have been from contaminated food as well. My eyes must have been white as saucers. I told him I'd be there right away and hung up. When I returned to the kitchen, the shadow was hovered over my untouched sandwich, staring at it intensely. Don't eat. I opened it up and started looking through the layers. I could see what looked like crushed green specks of something in between pieces of egg. I looked to where the shade was standing in front of the sink and saw a small speck of green on the floor next to it. I quickly walked over and opened the cabinet below the sink and saw an opened yellow box filled with more of the tiny green pellets. Rat poison. I remembered the sting I felt on my arm the night my ordeal began. The shade had been watching then as well. First a procoagulant, and now an anticoagulant. I looked once more to the shade. Its expression is always unreadable. Now I owe you another one, friend, I said with a smile. Like I said before, ghosts and shadows hadn't hurt me in my entire 28 years on this earth. But the living hurt each other all too often. <laughs>